Hello and welcome to The Print. This is Akanksha Mishra and today with us we have a very special guest, the Chief Strategy Officer of Axiom Space, Matt Onder. Thank you for being with us, Mr. Onder. Oh, it's my pleasure. Matt has previously served at the NASA Johnson Space Center as the Assistant Director of Engineering and he's also founded Houston Mechatronics, HMI. Welcome to The Print. Um, and first of all, congratulations on a very successful launch of the Oh, thank you. Yes, it was a beautiful launch and yesterday had a flawless docking with the International Space Station and uh, the crew is now on board uh, the ISS and working hard. It's been uh, wonderful to see so far. That's great. And um, honestly, Axiom has been the word on everybody's mouth for the past few weeks because it has marked an Indian astronaut's return to space after 41 years. Um, in today's interview, I think we're just going to get into the specifics of how Axiom Space has pulled off four human spaceflight missions in the past four years, um, what it means for private players in the global space industry, and what is the future of space exploration for humankind? What are we looking at? So, uh, Matt, I think we could start with the last question first. Um, tell us about what does the future of space exploration look like for humanity, but also for Axiom. Um, I think you can start by telling us a bit about the Axiom Space Station, which is uh, something that you're building to be launched by the end of this decade after the International Space Station winds up. Uh, what are the updates on that? What are we? What's the timeline? What are we looking at? Yeah. Yeah, uh, no, you're absolutely right. The the primary uh, focus of Axiom Space is to build uh, the first commercial space station. Um, and so we're well on our way to doing that. Uh, the first module will launch in 27, and we will actually attach that module to the International Space Station. We're, we're the only uh, company that will be allowed to, to attach to the International Space Station. And uh, that first module is primarily going to be to... Uh, um, transfer hardware and experiments and science packages that NASA wants to continue, the European Space Agency wants to continue, the Japanese want to continue. Uh, and then we'll separate that module from, from the International Space Station. And then we'll uh, continue to build our space station. We'll add a, a habitation module is the second module. We'll add an airlock. We'll add a manufacturing module. Uh, and each of those will come about nine months apart. Um, and so by 2030, we'll have a substantial uh, capability on orbit and be able to um, replace the ISS. But our, our, our dream, though, is to really expand um, space to everyone everywhere um, and, and to be a place where lots of countries can participate. Um, the particular design of our space station really allows us to add modules uh, really uh, indefinitely. So we envision having modules that might be dedicated to a particular country. Um, for example, uh, Saudi Arabia would like to have a module. Um, the Italians would like to have their own module. And then ultimately, um, what I think is going to change the world is the ability to make things in the microgravity environment that you can't make on Earth. Uh, we're already seeing some indications of that, uh, certainly through the history of the ISS. Uh, but even in our private astronaut missions, we're, we're doing significant experiments that are showing um, the ability to make things in space that you can't make on Earth. And so what that will lead to is there'll probably be modules on our space station that are um, built by companies that have uh, that want to make something uh, in space so it's a very very exciting time uh, in in space exploration with so many commercial uh, players and so many opportunities to really expand what we uh, are doing in space um, and that's brilliant. And you're right, it is indeed an exciting time. And um, I think now coming back to the present, um, you know, we can't not talk about the Axiom 4 mission. That's why we're here today. Um, but for a minute there, it sure was looking dicey. So, um, you know, uh, can you just tell us a little bit about the delays in the Axiom 4 mission? What were some of the challenges, you know, both operational and otherwise, that the Axiom team had to work through? And now, I mean, 
uh, you know, the launch and the docking was very successful. But um, what were some of the challenges? Yeah, you know, um, it still remains very challenging and difficult to go to space. You know, it, it requires uh, tremendous technology and and complicated machines that have to all work, you know, with hundreds of thousands of parts. And so um, while the delay I know was um, uh, frustrating and difficult, it, it was not untypical. You know, um, there's always issues that have to be worked through. You know, our number one priority is to, to launch safely. And so we have a lot of um, rigor in place and a lot of checks and a lot of reviews. And, and so we just went through that process and, and had a few issues that had to be worked. Um, and then, you know, the one thing that was probably a little unusual was the issue on the International Space Station itself. And it's probably more an indication that it, it is getting old. Uh, it's been in orbit for nearly 30 years. It's had continual human presence for 25 years. And, and it's sort of starting to show some signs of age, which is why NASA wants to retire it at the end of the decade. Um, and so the teams um, you know, saw some data that, that um, was unusual. And so we just wanted to take the time to, to work through it, to, to get, you know, the Roscosmos and NASA together to look at the issues and get everybody comfortable with the data and, and have a plan going forward. So while it took a, a couple extra weeks, it was it was the right thing to do and uh, sort of just part of human spaceflight. Yeah. Uh, no, definitely. That makes sense. Um, and now Axiom um, has pretty much been on a roll for the past four years, but especially this week, I'd like to point you to the fact that there were two pretty big significant milestones for India in terms of Axiom. One was obviously Shubhanshu Shukla's launch, but the second was also that Axiom signed a memorandum of understanding with Skyroot Aerospace, which is, um, you know, one of India's largest space tech companies. Um, now, can you tell us a little bit about the collab, what it would mean? mean for Skyroot, for you, um, and are there any future collaborations with Indian organizations that we can expect from Axiom? Yeah, yeah. So I, I think Skyroot is is just the beginning. Um, we've been talking with them uh, for, for a long time, uh, and we want to be able to um, promote and support an entire ecosystem in space. And we think we need to, you know, um, if if we're right, and I, 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 I know we are, about the things that we will manufacture in space, what that will mean is we're going to need all kinds of launch vehicles and, and cargo vehicles and, and capability around the world to support that. And uh, Skyroot's a, a great example of a um, potential cargo provider and maybe even human spaceflight provider for us in the future. And, and you know, of course, um, bigger than just Axiom, you know, the U.S. and India want to work together uh, in space. Um, you know, our administration and your prime minister have talked about it uh, in the past. And, and, and so I think there's a much broader collaboration between the U.S. and, and India uh, going forward. And I think this AX4 mission is, is just the start. Um, and so we're very, very excited and, and think that there are going to be all kinds of opportunities in the future to work together. And, you know, another uh, example is the, the ISRO chairman and his team came and visited Axiom and we talked about a number of technologies that we might share and work together uh, on to support the Indian space station. Yeah, and that's a very good point, actually. I mean, uh, ISRO is planning the, it's called the BAS, the Bharati Antrik Station by 2040. Um, but, uh, you know, in the same breath as you talked about India and US collaborating on space, what we're also seeing is um, both India and US uh, expanding commercial operations on space. And that's something that I think Axiom is the best tutor to talk about. How do you see the future of private companies private commercial sector in the growing global space economy? What do you think in the next few years this role is going to be? Um, you know, because Axiom itself has collaborated with so many countries. Just an Axe you have India, you have Hungary, you have Poland. Um, all of these countries looking to expand their space missions. 
and you were the first private company to launch a mission to, to the IA, to the ISS. So um, just tell us a little bit about the future of private companies and private players in the space economy. Yeah, I think uh, especially in, in low Earth orbit, there's now an opportunity for commercial companies. Um, if you look 20 years ago, um, it was just impossible for a commercial company to build a space station. It, it really needed a country and all the resources of a country to really do that. But because of advances in technology, because of all the lessons we've learned from from the International Space Station, it's now possible for a commercial company to build a space station and to be able to operate it. And so I think that's the future in low Earth orbit. And, and it also creates an opportunity for NASA and other space agencies around the world to then focus on further exploration to the moon, to Mars, and, and allow commercial entities to really run the low Earth orbit. So I think that's definitely the future. And again, I think, you know, we will build a space station in which NASA can continue to use and ESA and India and, and all the other space agencies that want to use our space station. But the primary business will be from companies that want to make something. Um, I'll give you a few examples. So on the International Space Station, there's been a demonstration of the uh, manufacturing of fiber optic cable. If you make fiber optic cable in microgravity, it has 100 times more bandwidth than the same cable you make on the Earth. And it's because all the molecules and atoms align how they want to, as opposed to being affected by gravity on Earth. Another example, and we've flown this uh, team uh, on all four of our missions, is <clears throat> there are biological systems that behave differently in space. So uh, stem cells grow 20 times faster. Uh, cancer tumors grow differently in microgravity. And what that's allowed these researchers that um, are partner at uh, uh, University of California, San Diego, they've been able to discover drugs that um, are, are more effective and potentially more effective for cancer treatment. In fact, one of the drugs um, just got approval in the U.S. to go to the next level of clinical trials. And they're flying that drug again uh, on this flight to, to do further experiments. So I think that's just one example of many that are going to occur once there's a commercial space station where you can make these things. And, and, and the difference will be on the International Space Station, NASA will gladly do the research and show that something is possible. But then NASA can't then turn around and make a million of something for someone. But once there's a commercial space station, we can make a million of something for someone. We can build an entire module dedicated to research or, or, or dedicated to the manufacture of those things. So I think 15 to 20 years from now, we're all gonna be surrounded by objects that we can't imagine how we'd live without that were made in space. Um, that was very well said. And, um, you know, while I do completely agree with you on, um, you know, the lower Earth orbit being, you know, very soon it's going to be the space for private players. Um, Axiom also, however, is, um, you know, collaborating with NASA on uh, something else, which is building the next generation spacesuits for Artemis and Mars missions. So, you know, Axiom definitely has its sights beyond the lower Earth orbit. Um, what, what can you tell us about, um, you know, just a little bit about the structure and the design of these, like what makes these spacesuits next generation? Um, you know, what does this mean for the next generation of space missions? Yeah. Yeah, no, we're, we're very proud to um, be the spacesuit provider for not only for NASA, but for all of the countries that are participating in the Artemis program. Um, and uh, it's the first time in about 40 years that uh, we've built a spacesuit. Um, so it was definitely time for, for an upgrade. And our spacesuit um, has much, much more mobility and capability than the existing suit and certainly much more than the suits that were worn uh, during Apollo. If you look at those videos of the uh, suit on 
uh, worn during Apollo. They had very, very little mobility in the legs. They sort of just hopped around. They, they couldn't really bend down and pick things up. Our suit, much more mo mo mobility, much more capability, uh, much more visibility in the suit. And then it's just modernized and so should be a lot more capable. Uh, and, of course, we're building that suit um, not only for uh, surface operations, but it will also be the suit that we use on our own space station to do maintenance and to do spacewalks. Um, so we're very excited about it. It's also a unique contract um, with NASA in that we will own the suit and NASA will procure the service of the suit. And what that allows us to do is to have some really interesting uh, partnerships. So we have a partnership with Prada. Um, that they have expertise in soft goods and materials that's been very valuable for us. We have other partnerships um, that are supplying <clears throat> the little food packet that's in the suit. And and we're, we'll soon announce uh, publicly um, a partnership on the, on the visor um, with a, a private company as well. And so I think all those things uh, bring some excitement uh, to, to the suit as well. But going to be an amazing thing. You know, it, it will be the suit that's worn by the first woman uh, on the moon, the first person of color. Uh, and so we're very, very proud uh, to be that uh, suit provider for NASA and for all the countries participating in Artemis. That, that sounds great. So whether the devil may wear Prada or not, we don't know, but the astronaut will. <laughs> yes. Um, but uh, that was an enlightening conversation. Thank you so much, Matt. Sure. And um, uh, we at the print will definitely be tracking the Axpo mission daily. Um, and we're all rooting for its success as, as, as we're rooting for yours. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you to our audience for tuning into the print.